Thank you all for coming. Um, this is a new presentation of new material, and so I'm assuming that everyone is up to speed on all the old material. <laughs> if that's not the case, we're going to do a very quick review, but we're not going to do, um, I'm not going to start from the beginning again, because if I do that, we'll be here all night, and so this is new material. Also, I'm going to ask everyone to be a little patient. I'm going to do the hard, troublesome, math type stuff first, and then get into the stuff that's easy to understand, and new material later, so bear with it for a little while. But I do think it's worth updating what we've done before, and um, writing some of the intermediate things, and then the new material. The, the title of, of the talk tonight is The Matrix of Meaning for Sacred Alphabets. And although I'm only going to be dealing with the Hebrew alphabet, what I'm saying appears to be true by and large for the Arabic and the Greek alphabet, and in some related ways we think with some of the Eastern traditions as well, Tibetan perhaps. But I haven't done that work. Um, so I'm going to use the Hebrew, and we know that the Greek alphabet is related to the Hebrew, and we know that the Arabic alphabet is related to the Hebrew. They both have the same num numerological connection. A is one, alpha is one. I don't know what the Arabic name is, but the A letter is always one, and they all have the same numerical value. And you can parallel these alphabets. And they also have the same equivalent with English, except in English we only have 26 letters, and in Hebrew there are 27 in the full alphabet. And the letter that's missing is near the middle of the alphabet, and it's the one that I, I use a, an English dollar sign for. It doesn't have anything to do with a dollar sign. So I think the thing to do is for me to try to follow my outline, which is very difficult for me to do. And if we do that, then we should be able to accomplish what I hope we can accomplish tonight. So thank you all for coming. Um, this work is done on the, under the auspices of the Meru Foundation, which is a nonprofit foundation. Um, some of the other people here can help you with information about what we're doing, if you're curious. And there are videotapes of the old material and the update material, and we're making a new tape now for the new material. So if anyone wants to get caught up, there are tapes available here, and they're also at Cody's on Telegraph Air. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to rediscover the obvious. If it isn't going to turn out to be obvious when we're done, then it probably wasn't right. And so this is going to be a rediscovery of what it's hard to believe isn't known. Um, I certainly find it hard to believe that some of these ideas are not known, at least the bottom line ideas we'll get to at the end. We're going to be talking about how we generate letters of the alphabet. And we're going to be talking about the meaning of sacred alphabets and their relationship to both the physical world and to the spiritual world. And that's the primary model, the relationship of the two parts of reality. We exist in an external reality, physical reality, and we have an internal reality, our consciousness. Um, inside is our consciousness, outside is the physical world. And that relationship between inside and outside is the basis for this whole presentation. In fact, that's the first letter of the text of Genesis, is the letter B. And the letter B stands for the distinction between inside and outside. It means a house, and we'll get into some of that as we go on. Um, we're going to talk about not only um, some of these forms, which many of you have seen over the years, but now, finally, I'm going to try to identify some of these forms um, a little better. Um, we've gone through in the past what happened when we uh, attempted to look at the beginning of Genesis in Hebrew. And what we found is... I'm not going to, I didn't bring the, the, the large posters for that, but this pyramid-shaped object, as you can see, has letters that are all paired up. Some of the letters aren't the same, we'll talk about that too. These are the letters of the Hebrew text of Genesis, the first verse. And all that's happened here is we've taken the first verse, which should be up on the wall, and this you've seen from before. We recognize it as the first natural unit of the text, and we took... Um, Carlos Suarez and other Kabbalists' opinion, literally. Um, the teaching is that the secret of the whole universe, of everything we could ever know, is in the first letter of the sacred text. But if you can't figure it out from the first letter, it's repeated in greater detail in the first word. If you can't figure it out from the first word, it's repeated in greater detail in the first verse, in the first day, in the first week, etc. Um, a description of a hierarchical system. Well, obviously, when I started this, it wasn't too easy to figure out the secret from the first letter. But now it becomes clear why the first letter has to be B. And that B stands for a container, for a box, for a house, the distinction between inside and outside. 
And then what we did with, the, with this sequence of Hebrew letters is we noticed these patterns, which I've talked about before, and I'm not going to get into. We noticed that the initial B and the final Z, I'll use the English names for the letters, they're, they're equivalent, um, form a big olive, a big A. And so it's as if the head and tail of this snake that eats its tail comes back on itself. And as we've seen before, it forms this toroidal loop. In fact, that's what this pattern does. This little pyramid-shaped object, which is shaped this way for mathematical reasons, basically correlates the same letters with themselves as you curl around the first verse. If you think of sort of a bead chain with each letter being on a bead, and you can curl the chain around so the same letters line up. That's all I've done here. Uh, this pattern is so strong that correlates the letters at the beginning of Genesis that you could uniquely replace a letter if it had been miscopied, which would have been a horrible tragedy, of course, from a religious point of view, by just reference to the other letters of the first verse. It's that deeply self-referential. It's that deeply autocorrelated. It's that strong a pattern. But it's important now to, for us to try to figure out what these patterns represent represent. And what we found before that they represented was a way of generating the Hebrew alphabet. And that's what um, the basis of the previous work has been. And so what we want to do now is expand on that and find out how that works and what else it implies. We're going to be talking about some mathematical objects um, besides Arthur Young's seven cycle, the turn the reflexive turn. We're also going to be talking about material that what Mr. Fuller mentions. Um, we're going to be talking about the Penrose Twister. We'll mention that. Um, some hyperdimensional objects and some reasons for why we would want to be talking about so-called hyperdimensional objects. Okay. The most important idea to keep in mind is that what, everything that we're going to be doing here is going to be based on the lowest order, the simplest the most direct representation we can have. That's the only one we can count on to be universal. If, as is claimed, these sacred alphabets, the Hebrew alphabet, is a universal language, a universal alphabet, then if a high order effect had been picked, it wouldn't be universal. It couldn't be intrinsic. It couldn't be rediscovered independently other places. But if we pick the most elegant situation, that's a unique situation. And that's the one that we're going to be looking for. And the highest ideal we're going to be looking at, what we think we're looking at here, in the terms of the Hebrew alphabet and in terms of the text of Genesis, is the single most deeply self-embedded, most deeply reflexive, if you will, most deeply self-embedded system that is possible. Now, if I were to tell you that I had the truth with a big T, and it was in a religious context, you would sort of walk away saying, oh yeah, I know the guy knows the truth. But if I told you that I had a truth, and I talked about the digits in pi, then you wouldn't have a pro problem with that. Everyone knows that pi is a fundamental truth of this reality, the relationship of the radius to the circumference of a circle. This is a fundamental of our reality. That's why we're going for the most deeply self-embedded, the most deeply reflexive system, a representation of that. Because if we go for that extreme, then we can have truth with a big T, without getting into theological discussions, which really don't belong here, I don't think. And the, the primary form that we're going to be looking for, um, which I'm going to tell you about as we go along, is going to be this form. And I'll tell you its name ahead of time, so that as we go through this, you'll get a sense of where I'm going with all this. I'm calling this form naked recursion. The idea is, it's naked because it is un- embellished. This is, I'm alleging, the lowest order way that you can represent the propensity of the universe to propagate itself. Raw, naked, unadorned recursion. And that applies to any system that recurs, such as a biological system. Acorn, oak tree, acorn, oak tree, acorn, oak tree, chicken, egg, chicken, egg, on the chicken, cut on the oak tree. But you get the idea. Any system that recurs is going to have this as a fundamental part of it. And then we're going to identify what this is. As you know from before, let's, let's just do that so we don't make a big secret of it. This object, this entirely asymmetrical object, which in the past we've identified as a flame, flame of consciousness. Hebrew letters are said to come from flame. Arabic letters are said to come from flame. 
Shadows of that ob of this object are all of these Hebrew letters. Same one object generates all of these letters of the alphabet. And I'll show you that when we get a little farther along. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I, I do want to leave that towards the end. Okay. Let's review very quickly what we've done in the past. And I, I think I just said it. Uh, we found a pattern in the letters at the beginning of Genesis that when we expressed it in its most elegant form, produced this shape. In other words, this you pattern... You said that that's the core of the Torah. Yeah, you can, see, you can actually see that. That, in fact, even though we're dealing here with a flat donut rather than a spherical donut, what this form really is, is nothing but the path of the seven color map, of the vortex on the donut in its lowest order form. Now this is not exactly the right shape for many reasons, but topologically it's the right shape. Geometrically it's not, and that's the second thing we want to deal with, is, is determining the exact shape, which is what wasn't available a couple of years ago. So, let's, let's talk about that. If you make a donut, an ideal donut, mathematician's donut, this is the type you typically make. It falls through itself, it's got two cross circular cross sections. If you slice it this way, it's a circle. And if you slice it this way, it'll make two circles side by side. This is fine for mathematicians, but it doesn't tell us how to make the shape. For instance, if I simply took a spherical shape donut, a, a dimpled sphere, which is going to be closer to what we want here, and I'll tell you why in a minute, I would have a form where the outside of the, of the vortex came along horizont horizontally, whereas on this form, as you can see, if I compare it, it comes through vertically. Why? Okay. Let's, let's do that first. What we're looking at, and in fact, I think I want, I want to, um, I want to read you a quote, I think. Yeah, let's do that first. Let's do that first. Um, except I don't have it in this book. Ahead here. This is a quote I've read before, and this is the key to the whole to the whole process. This is a discussion in the introduction to the Zohar, which is a Kabbalistic text, and I'll just read it to you, and then we'll talk about the key point. It's called the Lily. It says, "Students of Rabbi Shimon were assembled together and sitting in silence, waiting for the master to begin his discourse. At length, Rabbi Shimon spoke, and he said." as a lily among the thorns. And I've talked about that before. The lilies are all of these vortex shapes, all of the smooth shapes. In fact, you can see, if you look down into this, it looks sort of like a lily, like a cow lily. And the thorns are all the polyhedra, all... Well, there's a thorn. I mean, it looks a little like a thorn. And when you put the two, two of them together, you're going to make the system. So, continuing. This word lily, what does it mean and symbolize? He says it symbolizes the congregation of Israel, and the lily has 13 leaves surrounding it on all sides. And we've talked about that, about that before. If you make a sphere out of spheres, there are 12 spheres around the central sphere. You could take the outer set of spheres to be the meat of a fruit, and the central sphere to be the seed. And we'll see why that happens in a second. For this reason, the lily symbolizes the cup of blessing. And he goes on and says... Uh, well, I'll just read it. As there are five words between the second and third Elohim mentioned in the book of Genesis, one of these words is or, meaning light. This light was treated, well, now we've got light. This light was treated and became enclosed as an embryo in the covenant. And entering into the lily as a principle of life made it fruitful. And this is what is called in Genesis, fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself.